This video is sponsored by Card Kingdom. If you click on the link in the description below, it'll take you to their store and they'll know I sent you there. Hello everyone, I'm Nita Hone, and it's Friday, so that means it's time for another MTG Top 10, the series where I rank cards based on their historical performance at Magic's highest level of competition. Today, we're looking at bears, and when I say bears, I don't mean the creature type that we see every now and then. Instead, by bear, I mean two mana two twos. It's common slang among Magic players to call any two mana two two a bear because of the original two mana two two, grizzly bears. There are other similar terms, like a 3-mana 2-2 two -two is a Grey Ogre and a 4-mana 3-3 three -three is a Hill Giant, and those are probably things I'm going to look at in the future. But yeah, for this video, I'm talking about 2-mana two 2-2s. Two As we'll see, over the years, 2-mana two 2-2s two have gotten a heck of a lot stronger than Grizzly Bears. All the card had to do to qualify for this list was cost 2 mana and have a power and toughness that were both equal to 2. That means over 500 cards were eligible for this list, and in this video, I'm going to talk about the 10 that have made the biggest impact on competitive magic. Before I get started, a quick reminder on how I rank cards in these videos. A Pro Tour Mythic Championship or Players Tour Top 8 is worth 2 points, as are Legacy and Vintage Championship Top 8s, and a Grand Prix or Magic Fest Top 8 is worth 1 point. At number 10, it is Grim Flayer. A lot of the 2-mana two 2-2s two on this list have pretty dense text boxes, showing you just how much stronger Grizzly Bears have gotten over the years, and Grim Flayer is no exception. He brings Trample to the table, plus the ability to let you sift through the top three cards of your library, while also allowing you to put some of them into your graveyard if you want to. This synergizes well with the last part of Grim Flayer. He has the Delirium mechanic, which in his case means he gets plus two plus two as long as you have four or more card types among cards in your graveyard. Grim Flayer is awesome because he helps you get Delirium all on his own and he can often amount to being a two mana four four with Trample and a powerful card selection ability and that's a lot more impressive than a regular old bear. Delirium decks were big and standard while he was there and he helped them be one of the best decks in the format. He's also been played some in modern aggro decks that make heavy use of the graveyard like Death's Shadow. He doesn't have any points since 2018, but it wouldn't really surprise me to see him gain points in Modern or Pioneer going forward. At number 9, it's Duskwatch Recruiter, a bear with the exact same casting cost as the original Grizzly Bears, but obviously, as we'll see and have seen already, there has been a lot of power creep over the years for creatures. 2-mana two 2-2s two these days can do a whole lot more than attack and block, and Duskwatch Recruiter is a great example of that. Duskwatch Recruiter has a pretty nice activated ability that lets you choose a creature card among the top three cards of your library to put into your hand. That ability is some really nice upside to have on a 2-mana two 2-2, two, as he provides an excellent mana sink in the later part of the game and helps you find your gas. As a werewolf, he can also transform into Kralin Horde Howler, a 3-3 three three that reduces the cost of your creature spells by 1. Both sides of the card work well together, too. You can load up your hand with the Duskwatch Recruiter side's ability, and then you can play the creatures you found at a discount after he transforms. In both Standard and Modern, the Recruiter has mostly been played in Collected Company decks. These decks specialize in playing lots of cheap, efficient creatures, often including toolboxy creatures because of the card selection Collected Company allows. The Recruiter works well in those decks because it is a powerful hit off the company, but also because he can do a reasonable impression of Collected Company with his activated ability. The Recruiter doesn't have any points since 2018, but it seems unlikely that he'll be at 45 points forever. At number 8, it is Voice of Resurgence. The Voice falls in a subset of bears often called Hate Bears. This is because they are 2-mana two 2-2s two that provide that reasonable body while simultaneously preventing your opponent from being able to do something and or punishing them for doing something. In the case of the voice, if your opponent casts a spell during your turn, it punishes them by making a creature token, a creature token that can grow quite large. It is also nice that the voice makes this token when it dies, which makes it very challenging for opponents to ever successfully trade one for one for Voice of Resurgence. The voice just brings impressive efficiency to the table, and that has led to it being played primarily in aggro decks and block standard and modern. The voice has had a bit of a resurgence lately as a result of the Pioneer format being created. It's been played in both Heliod Life and Niv-Mizzet Reborn decks in the format, and it seems likely to continue to gain points there. At number 7, I actually have two cards, Servant of the Conduit, which is the legitimate number 7, and Long Tusk Cub, which would have been at number 9. 
I included both of these together because they were largely part of the same deck while they were in Standard, Energy. They also have something else in common. They both have the exact same casting cost as the original Grizzly Bears. Anyway, Energy was a fairly dominant deck in the Standard of 2017 and 2018. It was basically a deck loaded up with cards that make energy and cards that use energy. It just so happens that most cards that make energy also use it, like these two. Servant of the Conduit gave the deck a great way to fix mana, and Long Tusk Cub gave the deck an ever-growing creature who could often win the game on its own if it wasn't dealt with. Servant ended up with more points overall, because even after the energy deck was nerfed by Bannings, Servant of the Conduit kept seeing some play because decks were still interested in the fixing it could offer. Neither of them have been played outside of Standard, and it seems unlikely they ever will. Energy is a mechanic that was restricted to only Kaladesh block, and while energy cards were powerful enough for Standard, they don't seem strong enough for formats with larger card pools. At number 6, it is Containment Priest, another hate bear. The priest prevents opponents from cheating creatures into play with reanimation spells or other cards that don't actually result in the creature being cast. And because the priest has flash, it can punish your opponent for trying to do something like that, since you can flash it in in response. Then the priest resolves, and then whatever your opponent was trying to do to put a creature into play fizzles, and they'll usually be down at least a card. Containment Priest is originally from Commander 2014 and has never been printed in a standard legal set, and as a result, it is only legal in the Eternal formats. However, those are the exactly the formats where the priest can thrive, where people try to do busted things with cards like Sneak Attack and Show and Tell, as well as reanimation spells. Containment Priest is going to continue to be relevant in those formats going forward. At number 5, it is Gadok Teague, another hate bear, and in fact, it could be argued that the top 6 cards on this list are all hate bears. In the case of Gadok, he hates on non-creature spells with converted mana cost of 4 or greater, and he makes it so cards with X in their mana cost can't be cast. That's a lot of hate to be coming with the reasonable Grizzly Bear stats. Obviously enough, Gadok is great at hating on decks that plan on casting big spells. Those types of decks are often control decks, ramp decks, or combo decks. Those types of decks show up in most formats, and as a result, Gadok Teague has seen play in most formats. For example, in Modern, he is particularly good at hating on Tron, Storm, and Ad Nauseam. He's also useful in Legacy against Storm and Ad Nauseam. He also nerfs some cards that are commonly played in both Modern and Legacy, like Chalice of the Void, Engineered Explosives, Hanger Backwalker, and Walking Ballista. He even sees mainboard play in many decks since he has such a reasonable baseline. And in Legacy and Modern, Gadok is frequently tutored up from a singleton copy in the mainboard, making it pretty easy to make sure you get him against the decks where he really matters. At number 4, it is Meddling Mage. In the case of the Mage, you get a 2-mana two 2-2 two -two that shuts off one of your opponent's cards. That's some pretty nice disruption on a Hate Bear. This is especially effective against decks that are reliant on one or two cards to win the game. Failing that, you can also name a removal spell that you know your opponent uses, and oftentimes that's enough to disrupt their game plan. A little bit of history on the mage. He came about as a result of an old tournament wizards used to do called the Invitational. A tournament where only the top players from the year are invited, and whoever wins the tournament gets the opportunity to design the card. Meddling Mage was created by the Invitational winner from 2000, Chris Picula. Not only did you get to design the card, you also had your likeness used as the card's art, and that is the case with the original Meddling Mage from Plane Shift. Anyhow, Meddling Mage only saw a little bit of play in block and standard, but it's gone on to an impressive career in both Extended and Modern. In Extended, it was played in the main board or sideboard of a variety of decks, including Miracle Grow, Affinity, and White Weenie. In Modern, Meddling Mage's primary home has become the Humans deck, a deck which specializes in running cheap and efficient humans, many of whom disrupt the opponent's game plan, and obviously enough, Meddling Mage fits into that mold perfectly. The Mage is going to continue to put up points in Modern going forward. It has gained over 20 points in that format in the last year, so it'll be interesting to see just how much higher it can go. At number 3, it is Aether Sworn Canonist, a hate bear that prevents people from playing more than one non-artifact spell a turn. That effect is most impressive when your deck can make it so it isn't symmetrical. In other words, you're playing an artifact deck. But it doesn't only see play in decks like that, since it can really disrupt many other decks, especially combo decks, who often like to cast multiple spells in a turn to win the game, this is the most true with Storm decks, which at various times have been relevant in Modern, Extended, and Legacy, but it also creates problems for many other combo decks. This has led to it being played in white aggro decks in many formats. In Legacy, it's most frequently played in Death and Taxes, decks which specialize in running hate bears, like those on this list, and can tutor them up whenever it needs a specific hate bear. 
The Canonist is continuing to gain points in both Modern and Legacy. However, it isn't doing so at quite the same pace as Meddling Mage, and I would guess that if we came back a year from now, Meddling Mage will have overtaken Aethersworn Canonist. At number two, it is Kasali Pride Mage. The Pride Mage comes with two pretty powerful effects, especially because they come on such a reasonable creature already. Exalted makes it so that if the Pride Mage or any other creature you control attacks alone, it gets plus one, plus one. That means that when attacking, the Pride Mage can effectively be a 3-3. Three, three. The hate part on this bear comes from its ability to sacrifice itself to blow up artifacts or enchantments. One of the great things about a card like this is it lets you play something that hates on artifacts and enchantments in your main deck as it is still a fairly effective card against people who have zero targets, and generally the Pride Mage has been played in aggressive decks as a result. Modern has been where the Pride Mage has found the most success. That format has always had toolbox decks that have run various cards like Collected Company, Birthing Pod, and Court of Calling that allow you to search up cards that are especially effective on a given board state. So if an opponent has a good target for the Pride Mage, you can search it up. And if you just play it like a creature early, it can help you do damage. In Legacy, it's been played in a variety of decks with Maverick being its most frequent home. The Pride Mage doesn't actually have any points since 2018, and if it doesn't get some points soon, it will likely be overtaken by the Canonist and Meddling Mage in the near future. And at number one, it's Scavenging Ooze. The Ooze brings a ton of value for a very low investment. While it starts out as a bear, it can then start gobbling up cards in graveyards, gaining you life, and making itself larger. The Ooze is great because it lets you hate on the graveyard while also getting some additional value out of the ability. It's sort of like the Pride Mage, and that you can run some graveyard hate in your main board without giving up a whole lot because a creature like this that can get progressively larger is worth a slot anyway. While it saw some play in Standard, Modern is really where the card has made a name for itself over the years. It is basically a staple in green decks in that format, with Jund and Abzan being common places for it. It has also seen some play in Legacy, primarily in Elf decks. Scavenging Ooze is also legal in Pioneer, where it's already starting to see play. It seems unlikely it will ever relinquish its title as the number one card on this MTG Top 10. Well, that does it for this MTG Top 10. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to like it and share it so that others can enjoy it too. If you want to make sure you catch future MTG Top 10s, don't forget to subscribe. And if you need some binge-watching material, you should see the playlist for my MTG Top 10s on the screen now, which has over 270 episodes. Thanks for watching.